All right, we'll get started since we're uh, classically behind schedule. <laughs> um, so like I said, I'm going to run you through um, some more of the details of uh, if you have data or if you're going to get some data, where you might get it from or what it might look like to use Cell Organizer in this pipeline that we've been talking about. So for training, your basic inputs are uh, these fluorescent microscopy images, typically, you can use other types of images if you have your own segmentation methods. Um, but for cell organizers, usually we prefer that you give us uh, fluorescent microscopy images. If you have some other type of image, you can talk to us about how we might use it. Um, we would like you to have a nuclear marker, some sort of cell shape marker, so um, cytoplasm, ubiquitin, uh, plasma membrane, something like that. Uh, a protein of interest, whatever it is that you're interested in. And then, um, depending on the cell density, it's useful to have some sort of cropped region. So this is similar to um, the earlier suggestion that you use Voronoi to get an idea of the rough region of where your cell of interest is. Because if the cells are really packed, then um, cell organizers built in pre-processing might not do the best job in your specific case. You know, we can't uh, account for every possible cell shape and um, cell density. Okay, so once you have your inputs, you're going to um, get some sort of model parameters that we also need from you. So we need to, we need to know what protein type you're going to train a model for. Um, so that's like, are you doing vesicles? Are you doing microtubules? That, that we call a network model. Um, and that's important for selecting uh, what type of model gets trained, which, which uh, we talked a little bit about using Gaussian mixture modeling or inverse modeling for the, in the case of the microtubules. And it's also important that you give us uh, like the name of the protein that you have tagged. So for when we're building up this database that Bob talked about uh, on the website where we have a list of models, someone else comes along and wants to get a model of a certain compartment and a certain protein then they can look in that list and see if, the, if there's an available model or whether they have to go train their own. And this other one is really, that's really important is the resolution at which your images were taken. Um, that's because, like Bob talked about, we can combine experiments from different sources. So if you have images of microtubules and images of vesicles in Cell Organizer, you can learn a model that's then able to synthesize a cell with both microtubules and vesicles in it. And it's possible that the images of the microtubules were taken on a different microscope at a different resolution than the ones with vesicles. So resolution and, of course, point spread function, if you have it available, is always useful for deconvolving your image. Okay, and then the output that you get from Cell Organizer is some sort of parameters that describe your cellular components. Um, so those are going to be statistical distributions that we can then sample from to get instances. So what's required? Like I said, we need first a, a nuclear channel. I'll talk a little bit about how you can get around that. Uh, we need some sort of cell marker and some protein of interest and a cropped region. So in this image, you can see the cell is lying relatively by itself. It's got a nucleus in red, a uh, cell in blue and uh, protein in green. Maybe we don't need the white box, but we have some little, little cell pieces down here that we just want to make sure that cell organizer doesn't get confused about what it's looking at. Typically, if you have multiple cells in a field and you don't give it a cropped region, what cell organizer will do is it'll segment the cells as best it can, and it'll pick the largest cell that you have. So this could throw off your results. Uh, and I, don't, I really suggest using a cropped region if, if you can. So use some sort of pre-processing step like Veronoi to get an approximate region that you want to look at. Okay, so where are we going to get our, our microscopy images? Well, you can either do the experiments yourself, or there's a few of these that will be available. This presentation will be available online. So if you want to go on and look at some of these sources, you can actually get an idea of maybe there's already an image data set out there that we just haven't trained a model for yet that applies to your particular data. So. That's kind of a cool way to, to get. So don't worry about scribbling those down. That those will be available online. OK, so step one is segmentation. Um, you can 
you can use our built-in segmentation, which works using active contours. So what you're seeing here is a cell shape and some sort of previous slice that we have segmented in green. And what, what will happen is if we um, ran the segmentation, what you would see is that the green would sort of cinch on to the um, cell here. And what active contours is doing is it's looking for gradients in the intensities and finding areas of high gradients. But that's our particular method. Um, it has certain properties that may or may not be desirable to you, or you might want to change, for example, how smooth the boundary is forced to be, or um, how aggressive it is in, in um, cropping regions. So if you have a cell like a neuron, for example, and it has a thin projection that you want to actually capture, this might not be the best method, because if it's too aggressive, it won't allow you to have a really sharp angle going up like this, and it'll cut off the projection. So that's why we really recommend that you um, think about maybe using your own segmentation methods for cell and nuclear shape, particularly. Um, just because, like I said, every cell is different. They have different densities, different shapes. It's, it's useful if you have your own segmentation pipeline. But if you don't, you can feel free to use, um, use our built-in one. Just use it with caution. I suggest you look at the intermediate results and make sure that, that they're something that you would expect. So like I said, nucleus, nuclear channel is required. And that's because, um, as Dr. Murphy talked about, for the para, at least for the parametric models, it's required. Um, because when we're building a cell model, uh, we're looking at the ratio of the size of the cell to the size of the nucleus. So if you don't have a nucleus, you can't really look at the ratio. <laughs> um, you can get around this in two ways. The, the, the first is this nuclear hole finding. So sometimes you'll have a cell, and it'll have some protein that's here in uh, warm colors. And it, where the nucleus is, if it's a non-nuclear protein, then you'll have this, this sort of gap. So if your cell marker is a cytoplasmic marker, for example, it's often the case that you'll have a nice hole where your nucleus is. And so Cell Organizer has a method built into it um, that if you're interested, uh, we can talk about a little bit further in the afternoon, where it'll actually try to find the the hole inside of the cell. The second way that you can get around this is to use the non-parametric models that Dr. Murphy talked about, where you, you just have a cell shape, and you're morphing the cell shape, and you don't, you don't care about the nucleus. But of course, if you don't actually try and find the nucleus, then you have to keep in mind that all of the rest of your um, modeling and simulations that you're going to be doing are, are irrespective of the nucleus. So you can't actually go in and add a nucleus later on. Um, down the pipeline. Or you might be able to, but it won't be conditionally dependent on the cell shape. OK, so uh, Bob already talked about this. This is how we build a um, nuclear model. We take our nucleus, we segment it, we orient it, and we find the axis. And then we unwrap it and bu build this spline model. All right? That gives us our nuclear shape. Then we want to build cell shape. Um, so here's a, this is a slices through a cell, this particular cell. This is the 3D stack summed up along the Z direction. And so you get these, these segmentations. And then for adherent cells, um, we often, if you tell cell organizer that my cell line is adherent, then what we'll do is we'll chop off the bottom and make sure that the largest slice is on the bottom of the cell. Um, and the reason for that is that when you have an inherent cell and it's actually on the cover slip, oftentimes you're imaging a little above and below the cell to get the whole cell. And if you're doing the pre-processing in Cell Organizer, it'll oftentimes grab a few too many slices into the, into the glass slide. And so if you tell it, oh, I'm, I'm inherent, you actually can say, OK, I actually should have a large bottom instead of the tapered off bottom that you might get from the raw images. And then like Bob talked about, we'll build a ratio model for each angle of the cell shape. And in Cell Organizer, what you should see is you'll get this cell outline as it's printing out intermediate results. So if you turn on the display mode and you want to look at this, which I suggest you do at least initially when you're getting an idea of is the software behaving appropriately for your cells, what you'll see is you get these little red dots. And they'll, in Cell Organizer, they'll show up one at a time around the outside. But you should see something that looks like this, where you're getting a reasonable coverage of all the different points on your cell. 
and the cell shape. So this ratio model, if it hasn't occurred to you yet, um, has one really big problem. Does anyone already recognize what it is? You, right, you can't, have, you can't have anything that has like a long projection that's bending over. You can only have a single measurement per angle, right. So the non-parametric model can get around that. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about our work on um, modeling projections like you would see in neurons also. But again, this, is, this goes back to thinking about what you're modeling and what you're trying to, what kind of cell you're trying to model. So it might be the case that this ratio model is not appropriate for your work, and, and keep that in mind. OK, so once we have that, we have what we call our cell framework. That's our cell and nucleus together. We're ready to, to model some organelles inside. I'm not going to talk about the microtubules because they're currently not supported in um, the cell blender M cell pipeline. So um, I'm going to skip over those. But for objects, the basic, the basic principle is like this. You take some image, you, you deconvolve it and run a filter, and then you get some, some, some masked objects that may be actually a conglomerate of objects. But they, they look like really small little bits of pixels. And you fit Gaussians like Bob talked about. So here's the filter, the original, the filtered image. And then we're fitting different types of Gaussians here, either ones that are forced to be spheres or on the far right here, ones that are allowed to be elongated. And we use a Gaussian mixture model to try and uh, minimize the error of reconstruction error between this image and our approximation. And then that gives us a number of Gaussian objects and a size for each one. And then we can uh, look at where they're located in space, right? So if this is um, our, cent our center of our cell, we get a position for each one in space. Um, so a radial and angular position. And that's modeled as a distribution again. And then we can um, synthesize in silico um, images. So the traditional output of Cell Organizer a couple years ago was these TIFF images. So this one here is like an idealized image of two different types of vesicles, a cell and a nucleus. And you can see um, that, of course, it's kind of, it's, this is one slice through a 3D image. And you can see that now you have vesicles lying on top of each other. And it's not su necessarily super realistic. There are some problems um, with it it's sticking into the nucleus a little bit. If you look at the um, sampled protein, as we call it, where we're sampling individual like fluorescent particles inside of each vesicle, um, this is useful for if you want to do some sort of um, analysis on an approximate fluorescent microscopy image. So this looks much more similar to what you might see on your microscope than this one. But like I said, this one has some problems of allowing vesicles to overlap that we've since um, corrected. So the way that we deal with that in Cell Organizer is that we have uh, two parameters when we're synthesizing an object. One is uh, called a core, and the other one's the rendered uh, radius. So we can adjust the, the core versus the rendered radius however we want in order to get vesicles that are either maintaining themselves as individuals or allowed to overlap somewhat or always allow, allowed to overlap arbitrarily. Uh, and there are some cases that you might want to allow overlap. So for example, if you're modeling something like mitochondria, right? So mitochondria, you could potentially model it with this Gaussian mixture model, but they tend to be sort of these longer snaky type structures in, in most cells. And so what you'd actually get is maybe you want the objects to be allowed to overlap in order to reconstruct that sort of elongated shape when you place them down. OK, so this is now sort of where, where you guys come in and where the biochemical simulations come in is with these realistic synthetic cells. So we have. Now I've shown this picture, I think, you know, 10 times already. But um, we have also, I'll pass this around. This is one of our 3D printed cells. It's really cool. Um, yeah, I just ordered it. So 
Uh, I thought it was cool. I hope you guys think it's cool too. Gives you an idea of uh, what these things might look like. That's a cell with uh, cytoplasm, blue nucleus, and uh, green endosomes inside of it. So that's, the, that's actually one of the cells from the um, set of cells that we run in our models. And that's a completely synthetic cell from the non-parametric model. Right, so that, that cell was used to do, to do this modeling here. So that cell should be maybe in this picture somewhere. I don't, it might be that one there. The resolution's a little low. But um, right, I talked a little bit about this yesterday. We had this biochemical system, and we wanted to analyze the production of various pieces of it. Um, and then we built uh, this regressive model across our non-parametric model to allow us to look at the response of a certain species of interest over space, uh, over, over the cell shape. And you can also do this. I talked about it yesterday. You can do it um, with respect to other parameters, such as number of endosomes or um, you know, the, their positions. And so using this, you can really get a targeted idea of what, how the spatial uh, layout of your cell is affecting its response. Okay, so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about on that topic. How much time do I have left? Any? <laughs> I'll go for a little while longer. So that's, that's all I had to say on um, the current capabilities of Cell Organizer and how you guys can use it. Does anyone have any questions about using Cell Organizer before I move on? Like, about how you might get data for it, how you might use it in your projects? No? All right. Um, so now I'm going to just show you guys a couple of things that I worked on recently as part of my thesis. Um, because basically you guys started asking a lot of questions that were related to my, the stuff that I worked on. So I figured it might be fun for you to, um, to see some, some of these things. Okay, I'll skip over that. You already know the benefits of generative modeling. So I'll just remind you how we build the shape space is we take cells and we register them in some way and cells that are more similar are near each other in this shape space, in this non-parametric uh, model of cell shape. And what that allows us to do is you know, synthesize, like Bob said, by interpolation of nearby cells. And if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to create, uh, let's see if this will play. Oh, dang it. OK, that movie won't play. But if we wanted to create a. Uh, movie of a cell moving, what we would do is you could say, OK, I'm here in shape space. And at some small amount of time later, I'm definitely not going to be suddenly over here. right? We know that based on the fact that we're in a physical space and we have to move physical objects of our membranes. So if we talk about a very short time later, we have to be within some very small radius around that, that current cell position. right? And if we have a longer time step, of course, that radius gets bigger. And we can think, start to think about how cells might change over time by doing this. And so we did this by taking a set of uh, C2, C12 myoblast cells that were imaged every five minutes over the course of their growth. And so at the bottom here, you're seeing one cell that's been tracked over its growth. And it starts out as a small, round cell. And as it grows, it, it starts to get bigger and, and starts to get elongated and ends up as this sort of longer, larger cell. Um, and so we had a whole bunch of those movies. And each, each dot here is a cell frame from one of the movies. And there's about 4,500 frames or so in this particular shape space. And they're colored based on um, their relative position in a cell division cycle. So we followed the cells for from their, their first division to when they divided again. And so you can see sort of there are some regions that are more common to see uh, newborn cells and some regions that are more common to see later cells. And if we look at this um, region where most of the cells lie and we blow it up a little bit, you can see a little bit more clearly 
And I just picked out a few cells from that to show you what I'm talking about. Now these are not from, a, from an individual movie. These are just randomly selected to be representative of that region of the shape space. But what you can see is that region, if you remember, where we saw a lot of blue new cells, we see that course correctly corresponds to small round cells. Then somewhere in the middle, we start to grow and get longer. And then these sort of these ones on the outside tend to be the, the really long cells that are later frames. And the reason they're less dense, right, is because they, they sort of they get really long and then they change shape kind of more uh, they change shape more dramatically. So when a cell is out here, it can do several things. It can suck in a projection that might change its shape rapidly. It can divide to go all the way back to the beginning. Right? So that's why you see the later times tend to be less densely populated. Okay? And so if we want to just look at one, one movie, what we'll see is so these are the frames from a, a particular movie. I just chose one at random. And you can see that we have different dots. And um, you might be able to see the little blue arrows that indicate each uh, shape change in its magnitude and direction. So you can see we started up here. We traveled down. And then this last big step is a cell division event. Right? So if we use those vectors, we can start to look at how we expect cells to change shape based on the vectors that we've induced between frame pairs for all of our movies. So Bob showed something that was similar to these. His, the one that he showed was from a, um, a gradient of the shape space. These are from um, dis dimensional displacement. So um, each dimension that I'm showing here is a, a multidimensional scaling component. And what we're looking at is just the change in shape in this first one. And what you can see is, um, shouldn't be surprising, I guess, is that there's always going to be pressures to go towards the more dense regions of, of shape space. Right? And the reason for that is obvious. Uh, if you have some shape that's way out here, it's always going to change to be more like the other shapes, because we don't see cells out here. Right? And the same thing in the, second, in the second dimension. We see this pressure towards. Um, where most of the cells lie, which I've labeled in this black polygon. And so we can learn a model for the uh, distribution of shape change in each one of these components. And then we can synthesize new movies of cell shapes. So this is an example where I picked a random starting location. And it walked around and ended up for in 10 frames here. Now, the real movies are closer to 100, 200 frames long. And when you do run that, it gets a little bit um, more messy. But you'll see the similar type things where you, you walk around here, and you might bounce out for a little while and go back in as a cell explores its space. And this is similar to a cell extending a projection and retracting it back in. OK, so that's, that's all I had to say about our work on um, creating these movies. And I know right now MSL can't support the dynamic geometries, but what you can do with these, um, if you want to use them in MSL, is so these frames were taken five minutes apart, right? The time scale at which you might be interested in a biochemical reaction network is much smaller, typically than five minutes, or you might not have the ability to simulate five minutes. But you can actually simulate inside of each one of these, because Cell Organizer can create the geometries for all these movies. And you can just make separate M-cell simulations for each frame. And you, can, you could simulate for five minutes in this frame and take that as the starting setup, you know, the initialization for the, second, the next frame. And so that's a way that you can start to try to have these pseudo-dynamic geometries where, yeah, you're simulating in a static geometry, but you're simulating a movie over time of how a cell might change. Okay. So any questions on dynamics, where we're going with that, how might you use it? Yeah, Tom. Yeah. 
And then we'll have smooth interpolations between each of these frames. So you'll supply the frames as some sort of some sort of uh, you know SPML spatial or something, and um, we'll create a, an interpolation inside of mCell between each each waypoint on this um, walk. Right. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. So the other the only other project I was going to talk about really briefly is um, our work on neuronal shape modeling, since a lot of you guys seem to be interested in neurons. Um, neurons are kind of a special, a special case because, of course, they're very complex in their morphology. And so a lot of our methods fail. Like we already pointed out, the ratio model fails for things that have overlapping membranes. The um, non-parametric model, although it theoretically can work, um, has problems when you're trying to register these projections to each other. How do you morph them, and how, how do you determine what is similar and what is dissimilar between them? Right? So we really, want to, um, we really want to characterize the neuron as its own special type of cell. I think it's important that we build particular models for them. And we're not the first people to work on this project, on this problem. Right, so there, there have been many other attempts. You can, you can check these different tools out. They're, they're, some of them are quite nice. So L neuron, trees, netmorph, and newgen, um, and among others. L neuron and trees are generative modeling tools for modeling uh, single neurons. Uh, netmorph and newgen uh, tend to model uh, sets of neurons. So this can get into how neurons are laid out in, and intertwined with each other. Um, so most of them are focused on um, building this neurite morphology and kind of ignore the soma. Say, oh, it's just a point. Who cares about it? And uh, just kind of draw these, these sticks in space. Some of them have tapering functions, so you actually have thickness. But um, uh, they're not really ideal for if you want to actually simulate inside of a um, neuronal morphology oftentimes. I shouldn't say always if what you're interested in is the, the morphology of these neurites, then they might be the, the perfect tool for you. Um, but we wanted to look more from the cell organizer standpoint, OK, can we make a model of the whole cell? And can we start to put in organelles inside of a, a neuron? Because that's not really been explored yet. OK. so. This is our basic pipeline. We have some, some poor mouse. He gets his head chopped off. And then we take images of neurons. And right now, we use uh, neurite tracing codes that are external to cell organizer. We don't currently have plans of supporting our own neurite tracing because neurite tracing is a hard problem. And there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. A lot of smart people have worked on it. So these are two freely available neurite tracing softwares that we use to get some sort of tracing. And that gives us um, the lengths and the branches, the branch points of what the neurites look like. And then we can go into Cell Organizer and apply uh, different model types for the different components inside our cell. So if we want to model the nucleus, typically we'll use a medial axis model. And we might use the ratio model for the soma. You could use the non-parametric approach if you wanted to. That's the LZDMM down here. Um, but you probably wouldn't use a network model. That's what we use for um, our microtubules, for example. And then we have these two new, types, two new types of models, this extension placement model and this stick breaking process that allow us to create what sort of looks like a neuron. And then you can go to these simulation tools um, and start simulating. Um, you'll notice M cell is listed among others. Um, Neuron is probably the biggest one that people uh, use to look at these, but I'm sure you guys know more about that stuff than I do. Right, so neurite modeling, the way we chose to parameterize a neuron is using this stick breaking process. So you have this, this neurite here, and it has um, some sort of total length, which we'll, we'll represent in this gray, and then it has the length is broken up by branching points, right? So it has six segments, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And 
we can lie them along our unit length here um, and label the branching points. And what that allows us to do is then learn parameters for where we see a branching point and how many branching points does it, the branching point make and how much of the remainder here is broken up by the branch. So anytime you have a branching point, you're going to break it into at least two new pieces. That's why it's a branch, not just a curve. And you have to decide how much of that. And so that's what this, this psi variable is. And how much do you go before you branch? That's what this phi variable is. So we learn parameters for how long a segment is and how to branch it. All right. And the result is that we get estimates for the length, that total gray bar, the thickness, but we, we haven't put that in yet. We have um, a, mean, a mean branch angle. So every time you branch, of course, you need to know how, how far apart your branches are. Are they almost linear or are they splayed out? And then those two parameters that I talked about, how much to break it and, and how much length to allocate to a segment. And so if we do that, this is just to give you an idea that we actually do we are able to recognize the differences between different types of neurons with this um, model. So it's a rather simple model of neurites, but you can see for a number of different types of neurites, uh, we get generally a very high accuracy across the board with um, some confusion between uh, these two classes here. And what that allows us to do is we can synthesize uh, a soma and even a nucleus inside the soma. Um, currently, we're not synthesizing organelles yet, but so we have a, a detailed soma and in, internal nucleus, and then we can have these projections, and they're different for different types of cells. And so the hope is that um, we'll eventually be able to add into this um, models like the ones that we have for our other cells, like the GMM models or the network models, for neurons. And we can start to get a more detailed generative picture of how neurons are laid out and be able to generate um, really detailed subcellular organizations for these neurons. So, but this is the current, sort of the current state of things for neurons. OK, any questions on that? That's all I have. All right. There is no thing that would like grow these, these neurons in some space and they would avoid each other and so on. There, there is. Um, that's, that's mostly done in um, NetMorph and NuGen. Those, those tools do take into account. Not our tool, but um, there are some tools out there for growing or placing sets of neurons. Sometimes they'll grow the neurites themselves, and sometimes they'll just take ones that are already there and they'll duplicate them, and the, or they'll you know they'll take a set and they'll select a couple and they'll try and fit them together by moving them slightly. Um, so the answer is yes, that does exist, but not for cell organizer, and not in the near future for cell organizer. But the hope is that. Like I said, they can take instances and fit them together. And if we can generate high detailed subcellular image instances for them, then you can use their capability of multi cell modeling and our capability of subcellular modeling and combine the two for a really nice model. Yeah. Yeah, so we don't have the location of synapses. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, there's not really a good way to get that from the current way that we're processing the data. Um, but the thickness is, should be in there by the time we release this in the public version of Cell Organizer. And it's just, we have a model for it, we just haven't tested it thoroughly yet. So I, didn't, I don't want to say that it works <laughs> quite yet. The thickness is hugely important, definitely. OK. 
go.